Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim The story of Hazrat Yusuf al-Islam, part 5. The sincere prayer of Prophet Yusuf al-Islam. We have discussed how exceedingly devoted to Allah Prophet Yusuf al-Islam was, how well protected he was by him, and how often he called upon and gave thanks to him. This can be seen in the following verse in which Allah inspires him with the following words. My Lord, you have granted power to me on earth and taught me the true meaning of events. Originator of the heavens and earth, you are my friend in this world and the next. So take me as a Muslim at my death and join me to the people who are righteous. So Yusuf verse 101 as we have seen prophet yusuf al-islam was aware that all the attributes he possessed both the material benefits and his knowledge and reason had been given to him by allah those who deny true religion on the other hand believe that they acquire everything through their own efforts thus magnifying themselves in their own eyes and displaying ingratitude for Allah's blessings. Prophet Yusuf al-Islam, his prayer as recorded in the above verse is another expression of his faith and fear of Allah. Despite being a prophet chosen by Allah, he wishes to die as a believer and join the community of the righteous. Nothing is taken for granted with respect to his position in the hereafter. He has a genuine fear of Allah and calls upon him in his need. This is the kind of understanding and behavior befitting a believer, those who regard themselves as worthy of the garden, who claim that as beloved servants of Allah they will definitely be saved in the hereafter and who will belittle other people in their pride, are in a heedless state. The true believer, on the other hand, is always submissive in the face of Allah, is always mindful of jeopardizing his good pleasure and acts with the humility this awareness brings with it. The duty of every Muslim is to be sincere, submissive, devout and humble believer, just like Prophet Yusuf al-Islam, and to pray with all sincerity. So take me as a Muslim at my death and join me to the people who are righteous. Conclusion Throughout this story we have been examining the life of Prophet Yusuf al-Islam in the light of the details given in the Quran. Our only reliable source of knowledge about his life is that provided for us by Allah. Behind, beyond that, we have absolutely no right to add or subtract even a single word. Allah has in fact indicated this, revealing that everything that has been related regarding Prophet Yusuf al-Islam actually consists of unknown things. The story of Prophet Yusuf al-Islam concludes with these words. This is news of the unseen which we reveal to you. You were not with them when they decided what to do and devised their scheme. Surah Yusuf, verse 102. In revealing this information to us, Allah both teaches us important wisdom which we can use in our own lives and has also made it easier for us to take the prophets of the past as role models by allowing us to become acquainted with them. With the exception of true dreams, which, as we have seen from the evidence of Prophet Yusuf's own life, are not ordinary or everyday occurrences. We have no opportunity of actually seeing Prophet Yusuf al-Islam, Prophet Yaqub al-Islam, or any other prophet while we remain in this world. However, careful reading of the Quran and deep consideration of the lives of the prophets, seeing the environment they lived in and their exemplary behavior clearly in our minds, I am striving to understand it, may allow us to become acquainted with the prophets and to make use of their superior perceptiveness, spirituality and nearness to Allah. Everyone who listens 
to this story must therefore reflect upon it carefully. They must consider the wisdom of the prophets Yaqub al-Islam and Yusuf al-Islam and work out how to make that wisdom part of their daily lives. If a person abandons hope in the face of the troubles and wars that befall him, or if he says, this is going to be very difficult to put right, there is nothing we can do. When he sees the plight of Muslims, then we should know that this is terrible heedlessness. We should remember the patience, determination and firm, unshakable faith in Allah or Prophet Yusuf al-Islam who was thrown down a well, then sold cheaply as a slave, slandered, imprisoned for no crime and abandoned there for years. That is how to rid oneself of defeatism and despair. We must remember that in spite of the calamitous events that befell Prophet Yusuf al-Islam that seemed to be so great on the surface, he was freed from them in a moment by the generosity and mercy of Allah and secured a great blessing. Never forget that in the present day, just like in the time of Prophet Yusuf al-Islam, there is a flawless divine plan operating in every single event and that Allah creates everything that happens under his good auspices and wisdom. Do not forget that Allah has power over all things and that he always helps those who have faith and are sincerely devoted to him, who devoutly seek to serve him and follow his messenger. He gives believers blessings at times when they are least expected and helps them in unforeseen ways. A human being's sole duty is to worship Allah on the basis of these truths and to live his life accordingly. The Evolution Deception Every detail in this universe points to a superior creation. By contrast, materialism, which seeks to deny the fact of creation in the universe, is nothing but an unscientific fallacy. Once materialism is invalidated, all other theories based on the philosophy are rendered baseless. Foremost of them is Darwinism, that is the theory of evolution. This theory, which argues that life originated from inanimate matter through coincidence, has been demolished with the recognition that the universe was created by Allah. American astrophysicist Hugh Ross explains this as follows. Atheism, Darwinism and virtually all the isms emanating from the 18th to the 20th century philosophies are built upon the assumption, the incorrect assumption that the universe is infinite. The singularity has brought us face to face with the cause or causa beyond behind before the universe and all that it contains including life itself it is allah who created the universe and who designed it down to its smallest detail therefore it is impossible for the theory of evolution which holds that living beings are not created by allah but are products of coincidences to be true Unsurprisingly, when we look at the theory of evolution, we see that this theory is denounced by scientific findings. The design in life is extremely complex and striking. In the inanimate world, for instance, we can explore how sensitive are the balances which atoms rest upon, and further, in the animate world, we can observe in what complex designs these atoms were brought together and how extraordinary are the mechanisms and structures such as proteins, enzymes and cells which are manufactured with them. This extraordinary design in life invalidated Darwinism at the end of the 20th century. We have dealt with this subject in great detail in some of our studies and shall continue to do so. However, we think that considering its importance, it will be helpful to make a short summary here as well. The scientific collapse of Darwinism. Although a doctrine going back as far as ancient Greece, the theory of evolution was advanced extensively in the 19th century. 
the most important development that made the theory the top topic of the world of science was the book by Charles Darwin titled The Origin of Species published in 1859. In this book, Darwin denied that different living species on the earth were created separately by Allah. According to Darwin, all things living beings had a common ancestor and they diversified over time through small changes. Darwin's theory was not based on any concrete scientific findings as he also accepted it was just an assumption. Moreover, as Darwin confessed in the long chapter of his book titled Difficulties of the Theory, the theory failed in the face of many critical questions. Darwin invested all his hopes in his scientific discoveries, which he expected to solve the difficulties of the theory. However, contrary to his expectations, scientific findings expanded the dimensions of these difficulties. The defeat of Darwinism in the face of science can be reviewed under the three basic topics. The theory can by no means explain how life originated on the earth. Number two, there is no scientific finding showing that the evolutionary mechanisms proposed by the theory have any evolutionary power at all. The fossil record proves the exact opposite of the suggestions of the theory of evolution. In this section, we will examine these three basic points in general outlines. The first insurmountable step, the origin of life. The theory of evolution posits that all living species evolved from a single living cell that emerged on the primitive earth 3.8 billion years ago. How a single cell could generate millions of complex living species and if such an evolution really occurred, why traces of it cannot be observed in the fossil record or some of the questions the theory cannot answer. However, first and foremost, we need to ask with regard to the first step in this alleged evolutionary process, how did this first cell originate? Since the theory of evolution denies creation and does not accept any kind of supernatural intervention, it maintains that the first cell originated coincidentally within the laws of nature without any design, plan or arrangement. According to the theory, Inanimate matter must have produced a living cell as a result of coincidences. This, however, is a claim inconsistent with the most unassailable rules of biology. Life comes from life. In his book, Darwin never referred to the origin of life. The primitive understanding of science in his time rested on the assumption that living beings had a very simple structure since medieval times, spontaneous generation, the theory asserting that non-living materials came together to form living organisms had been widely accepted. It was a commonly believed that insects came into being from food leftovers and mice from wheat. Interesting experiments were conducted to prove this theory. Some wheat was placed on a dirty piece of cloth and it was believed that mice would originate from it after a while. Similarly, worms developing in meat was assumed to be evidence of spontaneous generation. However, only some time later was it understood that worms did not appear on meat spontaneously, but were carried there by flies in the form of lava invisible to the naked eye. Even in the period when Darwin wrote The Origin of Species, the belief that bacteria could come into existence from non-living matter was widely accepted in the world of science. However, five years after the publication of Darwin's book, Louis Pasteur announced his results after long studies and experiments which disproved spontaneous generation, a cornerstone of Darwin's theory, in his triumphal lecture at the Sorbonne in 1864. Pasteur said, Never will the doctrine of spontaneous generation recover from the mortal blow struck by this simple experiment. Advocates of the theory of evolution resisted the findings of Pasteur for a long time. However, as the development of science unraveled the complex structure of the cell of a living being, the idea that life could come into being coincidentally faced an even greater impasse inconclusive efforts in the 20th century. The first 
evolutionist who took up the subject of the origin of life in the 20th century was a renowned Russian biologist Alexander Oparin. With various theses he advanced in the 1930s, he tried to prove that a living cell could originate by coincidence. These studies, however, were doomed to failure and Oparin had to make the following confession. Unfortunately, however, the problem of the origin of the cell is perhaps the most obscure point in the whole study of the evolution of organisms. Evolutionist followers of Oparin tried to carry out experiments to solve the problem of the origin of life. The best known of these experiments were carried out by the American chemist Stanley Miller in 1953, combining the gases he alleges to have existed in the primordial Earth's atmosphere in an experiment set up and adding energy to the mixture. Miller synthesized several organic molecules, amino acids, present in the structure of proteins. Barely a few years had passed before it was revealed that this experiment, which was then presented as an important step in the name of evolution, was invalid. The atmosphere used in the experiment having been very different from real Earth conditions. After a long silence, Miller confessed that the atmosphere medium he used was unrealistic. All the evolutionist efforts throughout the 20th century to explain the origin of life ended with failure. The geochemist Jeffrey Bader from the San Diego Scripps Institute accepts this fact in an article published in the Earth magazine in 1998. Today, as we leave the 20th century, we still face the biggest unsolved problem that we had when we entered the 20th century. How did life originate on Earth? The complex structure of life, the primary reason why the theory of evolution ended up in such a great impasse regarding the origin of life is that even the living organisms deemed the simplest have incredibly complex structures. The cell of a living thing is more complex than all of the technological products produced by man. Today, even in the most developed laboratories of the world, a living cell cannot be produced by bringing organic chemicals together. The conditions required for the formation of a cell are too great in quantity to be explained away by coincidences. The probability of proteins, the building blocks of cell, being synthesized coincidentally is 1 in 10,950 for an average protein made up of 500 amino acids. In mathematics, a probability smaller than 1 over 1050 is considered to be impossible in practical terms. The DNA molecule, which is located in the nucleus of the cell and which stores genetic information, is an incredible data bank. It is calculated that if the information coded in DNA were written down, this would make a giant library consisting of 900 volumes of encyclopedias of 500 pages each. A very interesting dilemma emerges at this point. The DNA can only replicate with the help of some specialized proteins, enzymes. However, the synthesis of these enzymes can only be realized by the information coded in DNA. As they both depend on each other, they have to exist at the same time for replication. This brings the scenario that life originated by itself to a deadlock. Professor Leslie Ogel, an evolutionist of repute from the University of San Diego, California, confesses this fact in the September 1994 issue of the Scientific American magazine. It is extremely improbable that proteins and nucleic acids, both of which are structurally complex, arose spontaneously in the same place at the same time. Yet it is also seems impossible to have one without the other, and so at first glass, glance one might have to conclude that life could never in fact have originated by chemical means. No doubt it is impossible for life to have originated from natural causes, then it has to be accepted that life was created in a supernatural way. This fact explicitly invalidates the theory of evolution whose main purpose is to deny creation. Imaginary Mechanisms of Evolution 
The second important point that negates Darwin's theory is that both concepts put forward by the theory as evolutionary mechanisms were understood to have in reality no evolutionary power. Darwin based his evolution allegation entirely on the mechanism of natural selection. The importance he placed on the mechanism was evident in the name of his book The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. Natural selection holds that those living things that are stronger and more suited to the natural conditions of their habitats will survive in the struggle for life. For example, in a deer herd under the threat of attack by wild animals, those that can run faster will survive. Therefore, the deer herd will be comprised of faster and stronger individuals. However, unquestionably, this mechanism will not cause deer to evolve and transform themselves into another living species, for instance, horses. Therefore, the mechanism of natural selection has no evolutionary power. Darwin was also aware of this fact and had to state this in his book, The Origin of Species. Natural selection can do nothing until favorable individual differences or variations occur. Lamarck's impact. So how could these favorable variations occur? Darwin tried to answer this question from the standpoint of the primitive understanding of science in his age. According to the French biologist Lamarck, who lived before Darwin, living creatures passed on the traits they acquired during their lifetime to the next generation, and these traits, accumulating from one generation to another, caused new species to be formed. For instance, according to Lamarck, giraffes evolved from antelopes as they struggled to eat the leaves of high trees. Their necks were extended from generation to generation. Darwin also gave similar examples and in his book, The Origin of Species, for instance, said that some bears going into water to find food transform themselves into whales over time. However, the laws of inheritance discovered by Mendel and verified by the science of genetics that flourished in the 20th century utterly demolished the legend that acquired traits were passed on to subsequent generations. Thus natural selection fell out of favor as an evolutionary mechanism. Neo-Darwinism and mutations. In order to find a solution, Darwinists advanced the modern synthetic theory, or as it more commonly known, Neo-Darwinism. At the end of the 1930s, Neo-Darwinism added mutations which are distortions formed in the genes of living beings because of external factors such as radiation or replication errors as a cause of favorable variations in addition to natural mutation. Today, the model that stands for evolution in the world is Neo-Darwinism. The theory maintains that millions of living beings present on the earth formed as a result of a process whereby numerous complex organs of these organisms, such as the ears, eyes, lungs, and wings, underwent mutations, that is, genetic disorders, yet there is an outright scientific fact that totally undermines this theory. Mutations do not cause living beings to develop on the contrary, they always cause harm to them. The reason for this is very simple. The DNA has a very complex structure and random effects can only cause harm to it. The American geneticist B.G. Ragnathan explains this as follows. First, genuine mutations are very rare in nature. Secondly, most mutations are harmful since they are random. Rather than orderly changes in the structures of genes, any random change in a highly ordered system will be for the worse, not for the better. For example, if an earthquake were to shake a highly ordered structure, such as a building, there would be a random change in the framework of the building, which in all probability would not be an improvement. Not surprisingly, no mutation example which is useful, that is, which is observed to develop the genetic code has been observed so far. All mutations have proved to be harmful. It was understood that mutation which is presented as an 
evolutionary mechanism is actually a genetic occurrence that harms living things and leaves them disabled. The most common effect of mutation on human beings is cancer. No doubt, a destructive mechanism cannot be an evolutionary mechanism. Natural selection, on the other hand, can do nothing by itself. As Darwin also accepted, this fact shows us that there is no evolutionary mechanism in nature. Since no evolution mechanism exists, neither could any imaginary process called evolution have taken place. The fossil record, no sign of intermediate forms. The clearest evidence that the scenario suggested by the theory of evolution did not take place is a fossil record. According to the theory of evolution, every living species has sprung from a predecessor. A previously existing species turned into something else in time and all species have come into being in this way. According to the theory, this transformation proceeds gradually over millions of years. Had this been the case, the numerous intermediary species should have existed and lived within this long transformation period. For instance, some half fish, half reptiles should have lived in the past which had acquired some reptilian traits in addition to the fish traits they already had. Or there should have existed some reptile birds which acquired some bird traits in addition to their reptilian traits they already had. Since these would be in a transitional phase, they should be disabled, defective, crippled living beings. Evolutionists refer to these imaginary creatures which they believe to have lived in the past as transitional forms. If such animals had really existed, there should be millions and even billions of them in number and variety. More importantly, the remains of these strange creatures should be present in the fossil record. In the origin of species, Darwin explained, if my theory be true, numberless intermediate varieties linking most closely all of the species of the same group together must assuredly have existed. Consequently, evidence of their former existence could be found only amongst fossil remains. Darwin's hopes shattered. However, although evolutionists have been making strenuous efforts to find fossils since the middle of the 19th century, all over the world, no transitional forms have yet been uncovered. All the fossils unearthed in excavations showed that contrary to the expectations of evolutionists, life appeared on earth all of a sudden and fully formed. One famous British paleontologist, Derek V. Eger, admits this in fact even though he is an evolutionist. The point emerges that if we examine the fossil record in detail, whether at the level of orders or of species, we find over and over again not gradual evolution but the sudden explosion of one group at the expense of another. This means that in the fossil record all living species suddenly emerge as fully formed without any intermediate forms in between. This is just the opposite of Darwin's assumptions. Although it is very strong evidence that living things are created, the only explanation of a living species emerging suddenly and complete in every detail without any evolutionary ancestor can be that this species was created. The fact is admitted also by the widely known evolutionist biologist Douglas Futuma. Creation and evolution between them exhaust the possible explanations for the origin of living things. Organisms either appeared on the earth fully developed or they did not. If they did not, they must have developed from pre-existing species by some process of modification. If they did appear in a fully developed state, they must indeed have been created by some omnipotent intelligence. Fossils show that living beings emerged fully developed and in a perfect state on the earth. That means that the origin of species is contrary to Darwin's supposition, not evolution or creation. 
The Tale of Human Evolution. The subject most often brought up by the advocates of the theory of evolution is the subject of the origin of man. The Darwinist claims holds that the modern men of today evolved from some kind of ape-like creatures during this alleged evolutionary process which is supposed to have started 45 million years ago. It is claimed that there existed some transitional forms between modern man and his ancestors. According to this completely imaginary scenario, four basic categories are listed. Australopithecus, Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Homo sapiens. Evolutionists call the so-called first ape-like ancestors of men, which means South African ape. These living beings are actually nothing but an old ape species that has become extinct. Extensive research done on various specimens by the two world famous anatomists from England and the USA, namely Lord Solly Zuckerman and Professor Charles Oxnard, has shown that these belong to an ordinary ape species that became extinct and bore no resemblance to humans. Evolutionists classify the next stage of human evolution as that is man. According to the evolutionists claim the living beings in the Homo series are most developed than Australopithecus. The most important element of the propaganda campaign evolutionists conduct by means of the media is the way the utterly fictitious heroes of their accounts are depicted as ape-like creatures. The aim behind these imaginary representations that rest on no scientific basis whatsoever is to misinform the public and lead them to believe in evolution. That there is an evolutionary relation between these different classes. Technology in the eye and the ear. Another subject that remains unanswered by evolutionary theory is the excellent quality of perception in the eye and the ear. Before passing on to the subject of the eye, let us briefly answer the question of how we see. Light rays coming from an object fall oppositely on the retina of the eye. Here these light rays are transmitted into electric signals by cells and they reach a tiny spot at the back of the brain called the center of vision. These electric signals are perceived in the center of the brain as an image after a series of processes. With this technical background, let us do some thinking. The brain is insulated from light. That means that the inside of the brain is completely dark and light does not reach the location where the brain is situated. The place called the center of vision is a completely dark place where no light ever reaches. It may even be the darkest place you have ever known. However, you observe a luminous bright world in this pitch darkness. The image formed in the eye is so sharp and distinct that even the technology of the 20th century has not been able to attain it. For instance, look at the book you are reading, your hands with which you are holding it, then lift your head and look around you. Have you ever seen such a sharp and distinct image as this one at any other place? Even the most developed television screen produced by the greatest television producer in the world cannot provide such a sharp image for you. This is a three-dimensional, coloured and extremely sharp image. For more than 100 years, thousands of engineers have been trying to achieve this sharpness. Factories, huge premises were established. Much research has been done. Plans and designs have been made for this purpose. Again. Look at a TV screen and the book you hold in your hands, you will see that there's a big difference in sharpness and distinction. Moreover, the TV screen shows you a two-dimensional image, whereas with your eyes, you watch a three-dimensional perspective with depth. For many years, tens of thousands of engineers have tried to make a three-dimensional TV and achieve the vision quality of the eye. 
Yes, they have made a three-dimensional television system, but it is not possible to watch it without putting on glasses. Moreover, it is only an artificial three dimension. The background is more blurred. The foreground appears like a paper setting. Never has it been possible to produce a sharp and distinct vision like that of the eye. In both the camera and the television, there is a loss of image quality. Evolutionists claim that the mechanism producing this sharp and distinct image has been formed by chance. Now, if somebody told you that the television in your room was formed as a result of a chance, that all its atoms just appeared to come together and make up this device that produces an image, what would you think? How can atoms do what thousands of people cannot? If a device producing a more primitive image than the eye could not have been formed by chance, then it is a very evident that the eye and the image seen by the eye could not have been formed by chance. The same situation applies to the ear. The outer ear picks up the available sounds by the auricle and directs them to the middle ear. The middle ear transmits the sound vibrations by intensifying them the inner ear sends these vibrations to the brain by translating them into electrical signals. Just as with the eye, the act of hearing finalizes in the center of the hearing in the brain. The situation in the eye is also true for the ear. That is, the brain is insulated from sound just like it is from light. It does not let any sound in. Therefore, no matter how noisy is the outside, the inside of the brain is completely silent. Nevertheless, the sharpest sounds are perceived in the brain. In your brain, which is insulated from sound, you listen to the symphonies of an orchestra and hear all the noises in the crowded places. However, if the sound level in your brain was measured by a precise device at that moment, it would be seen that a complete silence is prevailing there as is the case with the imagery. Decades of efforts have been spent in trying to generate and reproduce sound that is faithful to the original. The results of these efforts are sound recorders, high fidelity systems, and systems for sensing sound. Despite all this technology and the thousands of engineers and experts who have been working on this endeavor, no sound has yet been obtained that has the same sharpness and clarity as the sound perceived by the ear. Think of the highest quality half-hour systems produced by the biggest company in the music industry. Even in these devices when sound is recorded some of it is lost. When you turn on a half-hour you always hear a hissing sound before the music starts. However the sounds that are the products of the technology of the human body are extremely sharp and clear. A human ear never perceives a sound accompanied by a hissing sound or with atmospherics as does hi-fi. It perceives sound exactly as it is, sharp and clear. This is the way it has been since the creation of man. So far, no visual or recording apparatus produced by man has been as sensitive and successful in perceiving sensory data as are the eye and the ear. However, as far as seeing and hearing are concerned, a far greater truth lies beyond all this. To whom does the consciousness that sees and hears within the brain belong? Who is it that watches an alluring world in the brain, listens to symphonies and the twittering of birds and smells the rose? The stimulations coming from the eyes, ears and nose of a human being travel to the brain as electrochemical nervous impulses. In biology, physiology and biochemistry books you can find many details about this image forms in the brain. However, you will never come across the most important fact about this subject. Who is it that perceives these electrochemical nervous impulses as images, sounds, orders and sensory events in the brain. There is a consciousness in the brain that perceives all this without feeling any need for eye, ear and nose. To whom does this consciousness belong? There is no doubt 
that this consciousness does not belong to the nerves, the fat layer and neurons comprising the brain. This is why Darwinists, materialists, who believe that everything is comprised of a matter cannot give any answer to these questions. For this consciousness is the spirit created by Allah. The spirit needs neither the eye to watch the images, nor the ear to hear the sounds. Furthermore, nor does it need the brain to think. Everyone who reads this explicit and scientific fact should ponder on Almighty Allah, should fear Him and seek refuge in Him. He who squeezes the entire universe in a pitch dark place of a few cubic centimeters in a three-dimensional colored shadowy and luminous form. A materialist faith. The information we have presented so far shows us that the theory of evolution is a claim clearly at variance with scientific findings. The theory's claim regarding the origin of life is inconsistent with science. The evolutionary mechanisms it proposes have no evolutionary power and fossils demonstrate that the intermediate forms required by the theory never existed. So it certainly follows that the theory of evolution should be pushed aside as an unscientific idea. This is how many ideas such as the Earth-centered universe model have been taken out of the agenda of science throughout history. However, the theory of evolution is pressingly kept on the agenda of science. Some people even try to represent criticism directed against the theory as an attack on science. Why? The reason is that the theory of evolution is an indispensable dogmatic belief for some circles. These circles are blindly devoted to materialistic philosophy and adopt Darwinism because it is the only materialist explanation that can be put forward for the workings of nature. Interestingly enough, they also confess this fact from time to time. A well-known geneticist and an outspoken evolutionist, Richard Lewontin from Harvard University, confesses that he is first and foremost a materialist and then a scientist. It is not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary, that we are forced by our priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations, no matter how counter-intuitive no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. Moreover, that materialism is absolute, so we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. These are explicit statements that Darwinism is a dogma kept alive just for the sake of adherence to the materialistic philosophy. This dogma maintains that there is no being save matter. Therefore, it argues that inanimate, unconscious matter created life. It insists that millions of different living species, for instance, birds, fish, giraffes, tigers, insects, trees, flowers, whales, and human beings, originated as a result of the interactions between matter, such as a pouring rain, the lightning flash, etc., out of inanimate matter. This is a precept contrary both to reason and science, yet Darwinists continue to defend it just as not to allow a divine foot in the door. Anyone who does not look at the origin of living beings with a materialistic prejudice will see this evident truth. All living beings are works of a creator who is all-powerful, all-wise and all-knowing. This creator is Allah who created the whole universe from non-existence, designed it in the most perfect form and fashioned all living beings. 
the theory of evolution is the most potent spell in the world. It needs to be made clear that anyone free of prejudice and the influence of any particular ideology who uses only his reason and logic will clearly understand that belief in the theory of evolution which brings to mind the superstitions of societies with no knowledge of science or civilization is quite impossible. As has been explained above, those who believe in the theory of evolution think that a few atoms and molecules thrown into a huge vat could produce thinking, reasoning professors, university students, scientists such as Einstein and Galileo, artists such as Humphrey Bogart, Frank Sinatra, Pavarotti, as well as antelopes, lemon trees and carnations. Moreover, the scientists and professors who believe in this nonsense are educated people. That is why it is quite justifiable to speak of the theory of evolution as the most potent spell in history. Never before has any other belief or idea so taken away people's powers of reason, refused to allow them to think intelligently and logically and hidden the truth from them, as if they had been blindfolded. This is an even worse and unbelievable blindness than the Egyptians worshipping the sun god Ra. Totem worship in some parts of Africa, the people of Saba worshipping the sun, the tribe of the prophet Ibrahim worshipping idols they had made with their own hands, or the people of the prophet Musa worshipping the golden calf. In fact, this situation is a lack of reason pointed to by Allah in the Quran. He reveals in many verses that some people's minds will be closed and that they will be powerless to the truth. Some of these verses are as follows. As for those who disbelieve, it makes no difference to them whether you warn them or do not warn them. They will not believe. Allah has sealed up their hearts and hearing and over their eyes is a blindfold. They will have a terrible punishment. Surat al-Baqarah, verse 6 to 7. They have hearts they do not understand with. They have eyes they do not see with. They have ears they do not hear with. Such people are like cattle. No, they are even further astray. They are the unaware. Surat al-Araf verse 179 even if we opened up to them a door into heaven and they spent the day ascending through it they would only say our eyesight is befuddled or rather we have been put under a spell surat al-hijr verse 14 to 15 words cannot express just how astonishing it is that this spell should hold such a wide community in thrall, keep people from the truth and not be broken for 150 years. It is understandable that one or a few people might believe in impossible scenarios and claims full of stupidity and illogicality. However, magic is the only possible explanation for people from all over the world believing that unconscious and lifeless atoms suddenly decided to come together and form a universe that functions with a flawless system of organization, discipline, reason and consciousness. The planet Earth with all its features so perfectly suited to life and living things full of countless complex systems. In fact, Allah reveals in the Quran in the incident of the Prophet Musa al-Islam and Pharaoh that some people who support atheistic philosophies actually influence others by magic. When Pharaoh was told about the true religion, he told the Prophet Musa to meet with his own magicians. When the Prophet Musa did so, he told them to demonstrate their abilities first. The verse continued. He said, you throw and when they threw, they cast a spell on the people's eyes and caused them to feel great fear of them. They produced an extremely powerful magic. 
As we have seen, Pharaoh's magicians were able to deceive everyone apart from the prophet Musa and those who believed in him. However, the evidence put forward by the prophet Musa broke that spell or swallowed up what they had forged. As the verse puts it, We revealed to Musa, throw down your staff, and it immediately swallowed up what they had forged. So the truth took place and what they did was shown to be false. Surat al-Raf, verse 117 to 119. As we can see from that verse, when it was realized that what these people who had first cast a spell over others had done was just an illusion. They lost all credibility in the present day too, unless those who, under the influence of a similar spell, believe in these ridiculous claims under their scientific disguise and spend their lives defending them, abandon them, they too will be humiliated when the full truth emerges and the spell is broken. In fact, Malcolm an atheist philosopher and supporter of evolution admitted he was worried by just the prospect. I myself am convinced that the theory of evolution, especially the extent to which it's been applied, will be one of the great jokes in the history books in the future. Posterity will marvel that so very f flimsy and dubious an hypothesis could be accepted with the incredible credulity that it has. That future is not far off. On the contrary, people will soon see that chance is not a god and will look back on the theory of evolution as the worst deceit and the most terrible spell to the world. That spell is already rapidly beginning to be lifted from the shoulders of people all over the world. Many people who see the true face of the theory of evolution are wondering with amazement how it was that they were ever taken in by it. They said, Glory be to you. We have no knowledge except what you have taught us. You are the all-knowing, the all-wise. Surat al-Baqarah, verse 32.